<laughs> hey everyone, so today we're restoring a couple of benches. So as you can see, the wood is just totally shot on bench number one. And on bench number two, it is not a whole lot better. And when you come down to the bottom, it's actually almost worse because there's like a fungus growing on it. So we're going to replace all that. The hardware is completely rusted and corroded. It needs to be replaced front and back. This bench is a little better with the hardware, but it's still definitely no amazing sparkly shiny stuff like it should be. So we're going to replace that too. The frames on the two of them, not terrible, not great. This guy here, the frame is just an ugly color for the most part. This one has some corrosion and some just gnarly stuff all over it. We got to clean it real good. But for the most part, just needs a coat of paint. The assembly on these guys is actually pretty straightforward. Just a whole bunch of bolts. So we just got to take everything apart. And this guy here has got a few bolts holding the seat and the backrest. And then the actual ornamental part in the center is all just held in by some screws. Now if you come across any bolts like I did that are completely rusted together, bolts and nuts just welded solid, you might have to bust out the penetrating loop like I did, but give them a good coat, let it soak in a good long time and they should back off. If not, you might have to resort to more drastic measures. Okay, real quick, here's where I'm at. So bench number one is just the exact same board repeating over and over again. So the wood that I chose is actually a five quarter cedar deck board. Now the reason I went with five quarter as opposed to three quarter like it was made before is because I want to widen it by six inches, but because it's just the exact same board, I can get away with that. Bench number two, however, because of that metal back piece, I'm actually married to the width of it and the thickness of the wood. So I have to use three quarter inch stock on that guy. So I've got some three quarter inch cedar fence pickets here and I'm just going to rip everything down to the size that I need for each bench. With all the straight and easy boards finished and cut, now I come to the one curved board in the whole lot. Now, wouldn't you know that this board was about three quarters of an inch taller than the board I had was wide. So I had to cut the end of it off and use some exterior wood glue and clamp it into place just where the very top of it crowns over and then clamp that together until it dried, just so I'd have enough material to trace the piece onto later. Now I used the same exterior wood glue on these two quarter inch pieces of poplar and these were intended to be the little flower pieces for the backrest of bench number two, but this failed in miserable fashion. Now we can cut all the ends off flush, just getting to some nice wood because usually the ends are pretty ugly and gnarly and a couple of them had some uh, splits in them. But then I'm going to flush up all the ends and cut all my boards to length and I'm gang cutting them just because I don't have a stop block. 
Now we can get good and comfortable with a rotor. Now I just have a hand rotor, but if you have a rotor table, it would make this worlds quicker. But I'm just using an eighth inch round over bit just to soften all the edges on top and the corners and everything, just so when people slide around on the bench, it's not cutting into them or anything like that. Now on the very last board behind your knees under the seat, and the very last board at the backrest behind your shoulders, I'm just going back with a 3 8 inch round over bit just to soften everything. So if you pull your knees in or something like that or you lean back on the bench, so nothing's cutting into you. It just makes it a lot more comfortable and more gradual curve. With all the routing finished, it gave me plenty of time to have my glue dry. So you can see here how little of material I really had to add onto this piece just to get that backrest uh, curve in place, but it had to be done. Now I'm also using the small little edge pieces from the backrest as well, and I'm cutting them out on here too, just because I had the space in the material. I'm also gonna trace out all my flower pieces on my poplar, hoping that this would be the only time I would have to do this. Now I'm cutting my backrest and my flowers out with a fine cut blade on my jigsaw here. Now if you have a bandsaw, it would make this cut a lot nicer and a lot smoother. The jigsaw kind of wants to walk around on you a bit, and you got to kind of fight it a little, but you can get the job done. Now the flowers are where the jigsaw kind of really became a little bit of a pain. It was quite tedious to do this. Again, a bandsaw would make it a lot simpler. Now because the jigsaw kind of wants to wander around ever so slightly on you, before I route this piece I'm going to sand the whole thing uh, back just to even out my cut marks and give me a much smoother finish with my router bit. Now again, same thing, 3 eighths of an inch round over on the very top of the backrest and then a 1 eighth inch round over everywhere else. With everything finally cut, now we can get ready and drill our bolt holes. So I'm taking some reference marks from the original boards and I've set my combination square to the depth that I need and I'm just going ahead and marking all my lines. Now again, if you have a uh, drill press this would make this a lot easier because you could just set up a jig and go to town on this, but a whole bunch of reference lines will do the exact same thing. Now I'm drilling all of my holes with a forcener bit to start. Now I basically grab this right size of forcener bit that will fit my bolt hole head as well as a socket that'll allow me to tighten it up afterwards just to give me enough room to get in there. And then I'm just eyeballing my depth, uh, stopping just so the bolt is slightly below the top of the board. And then I'm going back with a twist bit and I'm drilling my through hole one size larger than the bolt that I have. With all the boards finished, now we can move on to sanding. Now again, make sure you sand every side, every edge, just to get everything good and finished and smooth because people are going to be sitting on this and people's butts are pretty sensitive, so are the backs of their legs, so <laughs> make sure everything's nice and smooth. To prep for stain and clear coat, it's really simple. I like taking a shop towel and damping it with water and wiping down the entire board, all the edges, front, back, sides, corners. Um, this will basically clean off all the dust as well as open the pores of the wood and let the stain soak in a lot deeper and a lot better. As for staining, again, this is completely your choice, but I'm using a linen white stain here from Verithane Ultimate, and I found that this stuff you really have to apply heavy and let it sit for a long time, but make sure you do a test piece to make sure the stain's exactly how you want it before you commit to all your boards. With the stain dry, now we can add our clear. Now I'm using a very thin diamond outdoor rated water-based clear coat. Now I'm putting on four coats. You can apply this however you have the means to, but with this many boards, spraying is by far the easiest. But the biggest thing again to make sure, because this is going to be outside, make sure you get the front, the back, the sides, the edges, the bottoms, every corner, every spot. Wood's done, now it's frame time. Now I'm just giving a good, good pressure washing to these frames. and That'll help strip off any junk and any dust and spider webs and stuff like that, as well as rip off any old paint that might be sort of chip, uh, chipping and flaking up. 
Now this cast iron frame, I actually decided not to paint. After I gave it a good washing, it actually looked really, really good. It's kind of hard to tell on the grass here it was drying, but it looked fantastic. All right, now we can start prepping all our parts. So if your part is in pretty good shape, like this guy here, there's no actual corrosion on it, just kind of dull looking, you can go ahead and just give it a scuff with a, one of these red Scotch-Brite pads. Now this is a very fine pad, the red ones. You can find these pretty much anywhere. It's about the equivalent of around four to 600 grit sandpaper. Uh, if you have a piece that's a little bit worse for wear, like this guy here, there's a lot of pitting and corrosion, you're definitely gonna have to sand all that back. Uh, so go ahead and use about a 60 or an 80 grit sandpaper, sand it back, and then work your way up through the grits, doubling every time. So like 120 and then 240, and then working your way back up to the Scotch-Brite pad. Now you don't have to sand it all the way back, just get rid of all the pitting and corrosion on there. If there's still a little bit of surface rust, it's fine. We're gonna hit it with a rust-proof primer and it's gonna convert it over to a primered surface anyway. So. Now don't be afraid to spend some time here and remember this is what's going to reflect in your paint in your final coat. So make sure everything's good and smooth and looking the way you like it and nothing is creeping up on you because it will all show through the paint. So with everything sanded and ready to go now all we got to do is clean all the sanding dust off of it. So we're just going to use some rubbing alcohol and a shop towel. Just going to get it wet. Literally just wipe everything clean, takes off all the dust. Now if your project's like mine and you've got rust poking through, you're going to want to hit it with a rust proof primer like this. Now this is going to convert the existing rust and turn it into a paintable surface so it doesn't bleed through all of your top layers that you put over top of it. But it also seals the rust and stops it from getting any worse and it prevents any new rust from forming. So it's definitely a good base layer but you only have to hit it on spots where you had rust, not the entire thing. Just light dust coats. With the rust taken care of, now we can spray on an adhesion promoter. So it is exactly what it says it is. Think of it as a glue slash transparent primer. Now this is basically going to help all of your top layers that you spray over top of it stick a lot better. So this is a chemical adhesion and then sanding everything like we did before is a mechanical adhesion. So doing both steps is definitely going to help everything stick and avoid peeling and chipping and flaking. Now I'm sure everybody's had or heard of a horror story about rattle can paints. They never last, they peel, they chip, they flake, blah, blah, blah. The biggest problem is, is people put it on way too heavy and they don't prep the surface correctly. So as long as you sand everything down and you use an adhesion promoter like I did here and you spray 10 to 12 inches back from your surface like I am here and put on multiple light dusting coats, you shouldn't have a problem. The biggest reason that it will start to peel and chip and flake as people put on a coat way too heavy and try and do it all in one shot and that's exactly what's going to delaminate everything in the future. So light coats, pr proper prep, you'll have a great result. And then once all the paint is done then we can go ahead and spray on our clear using the exact same techniques. Don't falter here because the paint or the clear coat will lift your paint off. Now again I'm using a matte finish clear here but you can use whatever you like. So I had a bit of a dilemma I had to fix. Now initially you may have seen me take two pieces of quarter inch thick poplar that I had bought and glue them together to make all of these little pieces here for that flower. Now unfortunately that gave me a really thin glue joint and I couldn't really clamp them together very well just because it was so thin and a lot of these are brittle. They're starting to break. A couple of them have already broken on me. Uh, so I had to reevaluate my game plan because this wasn't going to work. This whole thing is actually pretty brittle. So new game plan. So what I did was I took some of my uh, three quarter inch cedar scrap pieces that were cut off and I actually had somebody uh, resaw them down to two quarter inch pieces for me and then I took drew out all my designs and I recut all my pieces out of a piece of single piece of solid stock cedar and then I just routed all my edges over so sometimes not everything goes the way you plan you just got to rethink it but there's always a way around it. With all the flowers finally cut out for the second time, I can finally get them stained and cleared. And I'm just using a black cherry stain on these guys, just for a little bit of contrast. 
So I'm just putting all the wood in loosely on the uh, bench for now until I get everything set into place. Then I can straighten everything out as I go and tighten down all my nuts and bolts. But speaking of nuts and bolts, I didn't want to run into the exact same problem I had before, which was everything rusted together. So I upgraded this time around to some stainless steel hardware. I got stainless steel nuts, stainless steel bolts, stainless steel screws, everything like that. So I'm never gonna have a rust problem again because these aren't gonna oxidize. Now I got inch and a half for the other bench and inch or two inch long for this guy just because it's a thicker frame, but everything's quarter inch in diameter, so. And there we have bench number one. I mean, come on. Look at how fantastic that looks. Look at it. I am pumped with how good this thing turned out. A lot of work, but actually very simple design. But it literally looks like something you would see in a far more expensive place than around my fire pit. But a little bit of work and some color combinations you never see on something you'd buy in the store. And you have something that everybody's going to be asking you about from now on. And what's wrong with that? Now we just got to finish bench number two. Now I'm not going to lie or sugarcoat it, the backrest on this bench threw me for a loop. It fought me at every single corner. It probably took me close to an hour and a half to get this thing assembled. And this was the easiest way I could think of it because it, if I attached the back iron to the wood beforehand, it might not be centered. So I had to center it up on the bench and it just would not go in straight and the screws kept wanting to strip out. It was honestly a nightmare, but I finally, after a lot of wrestling and some choice words, got it in there. However, for one final annoyance, every single hole on those flowers I had to ream out ever so slightly so I could countersink my screws and have enough thread poking out to hold on to the quarter inch thick flowers because they were some tiny screws holding those in and I didn't quite have enough thread. So I had to countersink every single one of them just because. But it turned out fantastic anyway. <laughs> And there is bench number two, finally, and it looks awesome. I actually really like the look of that old antique iron with the brand new wood. That black cherry is just so subtle on the flowers and the white wood all the way across it. it just, it's a really cool contrast in all of the stainless steel hardware. I think the contrast, it just looks fantastic. So, what do you think? I think they turned out awesome. So hopefully this inspires some of you guys to maybe get outside and restore a bench that you might have kicking around the backyard and maybe kind of falling apart. Restore it to it's better than former glory. It doesn't have to be a bench, it could be anything though, but I hope it inspires you to get out there regardless and restore something. Have a little bit of fun with it, be creative, and enjoy the process. So if you guys like what you've seen, like, comment, subscribe down below, I'd really appreciate it. And until next time, 
Thanks for watching.